I'm uh, Dr. Stan Akins. I'm the Interim Dean of the College of Business, and I'm very happy to welcome you to this afternoon's Cunan and Leadership Theories presentation. The uh, speaker today is going to be uh, General North, Commander, Pacific Air Forces, Air Component Commander for the U.S. Pacific Command, and even more significant, a 1976 graduate of ECU. So we're very privileged and honored to have him here today. This event has been a collaboration of many people at East Carolina University. Two such people are ECU alums, Steve and Ellen Cunanan, who have provided the financial support for these, this speaker series. They understand the importance of hearing from the great leaders of our time and of opening our minds to new ideas and thoughts and supporting education in the broadest sense of that word. And what I'd like to do is introduce Dr. Duncan, who will tell you a little bit, a bit about our speaker. Dr. Duncan is an Assistant Vice Chancellor who, among other duties, oversees our Army and Air Force ROTC programs. Since joining ECU, he was presented with the William DePie Award for Outstanding Support of the U.S. Army Cadet Command and was a key reason that ECU was recognized with the Patriot Award for Exceptional Support to the Military. We are only one of two universities across the country to be so recognized. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Dr. Duncan. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, today you're going to get to meet a great pirate. And so uh, with that, it's a distinct pleasure for me to introduce General Gary North. He returns to his alma mater after 35 years, uh, 35 years after he graduated with a degree in political science and also as a distinguished military graduate from Air Force Detachment 600. Air Force Detachment 600 has been here over 63 years. It's almost as old as the Air Force, so we have a long tradition. General North's bio is printed in your program, so I'm sure you'll take time to review his outstanding accomplishments. And rather than repeat that information, I want to introduce our speaker from a different perspective. I want to introduce General North, the pirate that embodies all the traits and characteristics East Carolina embraces. We strive to send our graduates into the world to be world leaders, lifelong learners, good citizens, and involved alumni. General North is a proven leader. He has commanded at all levels and is currently the commander of the Pacific Air Forces responsible for half of the globe. As a four-star officer, he is also in an elite group of defense leaders. He's a lifelong learner. Since leaving East Carolina in 1976, he has completed three additional master's degrees across the disciplines of public administration, human resource management, and national resource strategy. He is the personification of good citizenship. His entire public life has been dedicated to national service, including multiple deployments. He has over 4,600 hours to his credit. And if I can put that in perspective, a working year is, is determined to be 2,087 hours of the calendar. So you're going to meet a gentleman that's had over two years sitting in the cockpit of F-4s, F-15s, and F-16s. And finally, you're looking at an involved alumni. General North is an extremely busy man, but since just 2008, he has taken time to speak at the 2008 homecoming, homecoming event, be, at the be the graduation speaker for the university in 2009, and has spoken to ECU ROTC cadets on numerous occasions. He has been selected as a distinguished university alum and is back in Greenville to present not only for the Cunanan series, but also to support the local veterans which will have the local veterans cel uh, celebration in the uh, town park tomorrow. For the role model General North is, for what he does for this university, please welcome back a true patriot, a true pirate, General Gary North. Folks, good afternoon. Can you hear me in the back? Can you see me from the back? When I was here at East Carolina, I would sit in the back and I can tell you that the speaker here on the stage can see whether or not you're sleeping in the very back. And I know it's the afternoon. Um, I, I am privileged to be here and thankful for the Cunanan family uh, who sponsors this series of leadership lectures and certainly to Interim Dean Atkins and to uh, certainly to Steve Duncan, Dr. Duncan for asking me to come back and for Lieutenant Colonel Armstrong for having me uh, uh, to be able to talk to the ROTC cadets here from the Air Force ROTC and certainly uh, the opportunity to meet our Army ROTC cadets. 
Uh, it is great to be back. I know that there are some of you here because you have to be here because this is part of your schooling. I know there are some who have traveled because they came to school with me. We did all graduate. Uh, there are some who have not yet figured out how I got to this position. And uh, in, in fact, uh, Troy Pate is here who signed my diploma. And I think, Troy, the, the reason you're here is just to make sure that you're getting a return on your investment. And I, I am privileged to be back. Uh, it is, as always, nice to come back to where you grew up, uh, where you matured as a student and as an individual, and then where the university sent you out to do good work in the world. Uh, I really enjoyed, frankly, the extracurricular activities here. Uh, my, my grade point average was mighty average. Uh, I did have the opportunity, however, to continue, uh, as Dr. Duncan said, continued education. And frankly, the world education has been uh, something that I am very, very proud of uh, to have left here and then be able to go out and mingle with East Carolina pirates all over the world. I've met pirates from the North Pole to the South Pole. I've seen pirates in the combat zone and in all types of places. And I, I will tell you that when, when someone says, well, you were a pirate, you get a huge arg from them, and you start talking about Greenville, and you start talking about the opportunities that we have all had together. And so your college experience will last forever. Some of you will spend more years than your parents want you to spend here in college, but it is an experience which is absolutely incredible. I would like to uh, thank the business school for this leadership series, and I know you get a wide variety of business leaders and leaders throughout the world who come in to talk to you. And so what I want to talk about today is leadership, obviously. Some of you will say, well, what the heck does a general officer have to tell us about leadership, and it, particularly about leadership that hasn't already been said or you haven't already studied? Uh, I can certainly understand that, and I will tell you that it's a topic that you could talk about all day long. Uh, you can't walk through a bookstore or go to a lecture without somebody giving you their intent on what leadership is. There literally have been volumes written, and many of you will get your degrees and masters and then PhDs to talk about business. And then you will go into the world and you will execute it. It's widely discussed, there's no definitive answer, and frankly, in my 35 years in the military, I've found uh, when you are in a business discussion, the most useful words that you may be able to remember, particularly if it's a heated discussion, and this is whether it's business or whether it's personal, is to say to the other person, you might be right. It will end almost every discussion and argument. You're not conceding the point, you're just conceding that perhaps someone else's point of view uh, is equally as important as yours. So let's talk a bit about philosophy. I suppose the first question that you get in Business 101 or Leadership 101, is leadership important? What does good leadership mean for an organization? What does leadership do to affect the day-to-day -day operations of an organization? Why does it matter? Is it leadership? or is it management that matters? Which is more important? Can you do both, and does that matter? I think we all know the answers to each one of those questions. I think also that organizations without leadership are destined to fail. Whether you're in the military, whether you're in business, whether you're in government, whether you're a nonprofit organization, whether you're an athletic team, your team, whatever that is, cannot win without good leadership. Leadership sets the direction. Leadership provides the vector. And under leadership, leaders guide the way. Whether there, wherever, wherever there is a herd, it's important to find a leader. And it's important that the leader finds a way to lead that herd out of a pasture. Ultimately, the leader is the one in the herd that says, where do we go from here? What do we do now? And when things aren't properly planned or not going to plan, 
It is the leader that gets turned to and says, what should we do? And many of you have seen the IBM commercial where people are discussing things and the leader at the head of the table turns to everyone and says, you know, who's in charge of that? And the collective group turns to the leader and says, well, ma'am, that would be you. Uh, and so that would be you applies to every one of us who is either cast or position for a future or current leadership role. That, folks, is exactly why in that little nutshell that leadership is very important. A leader knows what to do, a leader determines the path, and a leader allows his or her followers to be a part of the selection of the path. It's paramount to any organization, at any level, any size financially, any size organizationally, leadership's the key basis. And really the one person, frankly, depending on the organization and the organizational structure, sometimes it's only one person who can set the path and the direction and truly make a difference. You've all seen examples and have studied many times the different styles of management organizations and leadership processes and leadership styles. Take Steve Jobs and Apple. He brought Apple to a certain point. He left Apple. Apple went down. He came back. He, he made Apple go to the point that it was when Steve Jobs passed away. He guided his company and his employees to his vision and his strategic focus in his vision. In our U.S. military, any Marines in here? Happy birthday, Marines, hurrah. Uh, any other veterans in here? Thank you for your service. Uh, those who are in ROTC, thank you for the service that you will provide in the future. And so let's talk about military leadership for just a second. General officers do a lot of leading. Most of the time it's not direct leading because you are directly providing guidance and support and effort and strategic vision to subordinates who then cascade down all the way down to the platoon lieutenants and the flight leads and the sergeants and the privates and the corporals and the airmen who do the majority of the actual point-to-point -point work. They are leading America's sons and daughters in combat operations today. Politicians and diplomats do a tremendous amount of leading. They're guiding our country, they're guiding the world through combat, through operations, through peace negotiations to prevent combat, through sizing of operations after the Arab Spring and other events have occurred, and certainly through the economic downturn, which is facing nearly the entire world. Witness going on, G20 and APEC, Witness diplomats working very hard to prevent uh, continued nuclear armament in North Korea and witness the effect of how our nation returns literally millions of servicemen and women who have served uh, in combat in harm's way. Witness head coaches who try to turn to a winning season. No doubt the Pirates will beat UTEP this week. Any, anybody, anybody? Witness your moms and dads who have led you to the position where they've sent you off to college because you've been successful, you've applied, you've been accepted, you're working hard to get through, and then allow the pay forward of our business such that we can continue with your leadership capabilities and future jobs and positions. Let's talk about leadership style. A leader knows the way and a leader goes the way. You're here in this particular series because you're looking and being directed to learn about the different styles of leadership so that you might be a leader of tomorrow. Some of you are wondering what it takes to be a leader. I suppose the chicken and the egg discussion of whether leaders are born 
for leaders are made is worthy to talk about. Here's what I think, uh, no different than anybody else. Uh, I think some people are naturally predisposed to lead. Some people are certainly born with an ability to influence others. That does not necessarily mean they're going to be or are good leaders. They need to refine a natural ability and an aid ability with the understanding of the people they're leading, the organizational needs, and then they need to develop a style that's appropriate for the organization that they are a part of. Those of you in the audience that are natural leaders know it. You've been told it all your life. You've seen it work throughout growing up, and you feel comfortable doing it. You could be called the alphas in your class or workplace. You feel at ease given direction. You feel like you've been born with that innate ability and comfort to do what you do so well. But you still have to work hard and smart to be a good leader. There are others in here who think that they don't have what it takes to be a good leader. Some of you know who you are. More importantly, some of you don't know who you are. Some have never dominated on those early fields of strife. We call it the playground. Some may feel more comfortable being told what to do than asking people to do things with them. Some would rather offer a suggestion than provide a direction. And that's fine. You were then, if you fit in that category, perhaps not naturally disposed in the role and accepting the role of a leader. That doesn't mean that you can't become one. It just means you have more to learn than someone that it comes naturally to. Frankly, no leader was born a great leader. They had those traits and they worked on it. A good leader, frankly, is always a bit on edge about whether or not their leadership style direction decisions are right or appropriate for the time. Because they know there's always more than one way to do things and more than one way to approach a challenge. Notice that I don't say a problem. Strong leaders don't have problems. Strong leaders only see challenges. And the greater the challenge, the more a leader works to bring it to fruition for the organization. All great leaders have to put a lot into leadership and into the organization. Most have an, an intense self-awareness of their own style, their ability, and their roles. And the leadership styles do very greatly, even in an organization which is focused and has a strategic focus and vision and objectives. Think about the cowboy leading that herd, either horses or cows. Some lead from the front, some push from behind, and some guide from the side. More importantly, they all have to work together because if one gets out in front of the other, uh, you will spook the herd and you're gonna spend the rest of your day corralling everybody back up and getting them back in formation. In life, I've often been told and often use it as well that it's very hard to push a rope from behind. Uh, and so leaders normally have to be in front. And leaders first must understand themselves. Good leaders are very self-aware, as I said. You should know your personality, your style, and frankly, what makes you tick. You have to be comfortable with it and you have to build your leadership skills upon that. I know that you have studied the different types of personality tests. Myers-Briggs is one of them. Everyone in a senior position in the military gets it. And you'd be amazed at the typecasting that the Myers-Briggs provides for uh, for many organizations, in fact, some of you, when you're out in the workspace, will find that you'll be asked to take either that or other leadership tests uh, and personality tests to determine your style, to see if you fit with the style of the organization. 
More importantly, you have to know the style of all the others that work with you and alongside of you and frankly, for you. Years ago, particularly in the military, we had the, uh, uh, some form of leaders that were very collective and collaborative and we had others that were tyrants. We had some who used the adage of, I'm a hammer, the rest of the world is a nail, and you're gonna see it my way or I will drive you into the ground. That doesn't work anymore. A leader, frankly, is one who knows what to do. Pretty straightforward, what to do in their organization. They know the way, they know how to get there, and they drive their organization to it. Cowboy could be very comfortable leading his herd from the front, from the side, or from the rear if it works. But if the cowboy drives the herd over a cliff, they're not gonna call him a very effective leader. And so while leadership styles may vary, there are other traits that cannot, and I'd like to talk to you about those. I'll go with three today because the business ethic is I'll tell you three things, you'll remember one of them, and we'll be in good shape. A leader has got to know the purpose of which his or her organization exists. A leader must be an expert in the workplace. When I talk to military men and women, I call that tactically and technically proficient. And a good leader must not be, in their own mind, indispensable to the organization. So, I told you, I'm gonna tell you again. A good leader must know the purpose for which the organization exists. It sounds obvious, but you'd be surprised how often leaders fail to understand the true purpose of their organization's existence. I once heard a story of how Coca-Cola interviewed, uh, you know, junior executives. Obviously a major corporation, they were looking for a new chief of marketing. The CEO asked everyone who interviewed for the question, what is the purpose for which our organization exists? Okay, in the back row, what do you think? Why does Coke exist? Well, they got a lot of answers. The answers varied. Some said the purpose was to provide cost-effective refreshment to billions of consumers worldwide. Others said it was to be a leader in the global marketplace, provide new green initiatives to change the growing, uh, changing global climate, if you will. Others said we existed to keep up with the competition or be the leader in the competition. Others said it was to focus on what's next in the, in, the, in the X generation and how to market that. All were wrong. They were all components of the greater purpose, but the CEO, the answer, or the answer the CEO was looking for was our organization exists for one reason, to make a profit. So if the new chief marketing officer, and you pass in the back, if the new chief marketing officer got too focused on all the outlier events, he'd lose sight of the bottom line fact for Coke that it's to make a profit. And we've seen examples of many companies who have a lot of cash, they go out, they buy everything they can and they start failing and then they're divesting all of their companies and then they go back to their core competency uh, in that. I kind of feel that same way about our Air Force and our military. I'll talk about our Air Force with, with all respect to the other service members that are here. Uh, I know a lot about all the services as a joint warrior, but mostly about our Air Force and senior leadership. We've got over 600,000 active guard and reserve, and the missions that they serve are widely varied. We've got pilots, navigators, contractors, lawyers, engineers, medics, technicians, uh, loggies, mechanics, doctors, cooks, and scientists, and everything else. It's easy to think about stovepipes when you're in your own stovepipe, but we've got a large corporation varied, and it's easy for leaders to only see what's in their lane. But the purpose that our organization exists 
is far larger and greater than any one career field uh, in the Air Force. The Air Force exists for a very clear purpose, and this is where we'll have the discussion about strategic imperatives and vision and objectives of an organization. We exist to provide combat air power through airspace and cyberspace. We support combat and a wide range of operations all the way down to humanitarian or throughout the globe. And a cook in the dining facility needs to know that. The janitor in one of our facilities needs to know the strategic focus and vision of the organization. Just like the chairman or a general or any senior leader, president, CEO, needs to know the name of the janitor who's working and cleaning his or her workspace because they're an integral part of the team. If you're a leader, you need to know the whole role of your organization. I'll give you an example. Kunsan Air Base is a very small base of 2,800 airmen, all with a one-year remote assignment in Southwest Korea. Everyone in our Air Force, almost in their career, will go to that or another remote assignment. It sits 100 miles from the DMZ. It sits within four minutes of tactical ballistic missile range from the North Koreans. It sits in an environment where there's over 60,000 North Korean special operators, many of which who are dedicated to that particular base if and when conflict occurs, whose goal is to penetrate the base and kill the base leadership uh, and kill the combat generating power of the base. The men and women, the airmen of Kunsan Air Base, know their organization and their mission cold. Their first mission is to defend the base, because if you can defend a base, then you can provide support from there. Their second mission is to accept follow-on forces, because forces will flow in to that base from around the world if and when combat occurs. And their third mission, when directed, is to take the fight north into North Korea and execute in the name of the president and the, and the Secretary of Defense. Defend the base, accept follow-on forces, take the fight north. That's an organization that has a very simple and very clear mission statement that everyone from the commander of the installation and all other 2,800 people involved down to the youngest airman who just got off the plane that morning understands. When you join organizations, if you don't know what your organization can do and will do, then you're not a viable part of the team. You need to be tactically and technically proficient at your organization to make it work. So, the real question is, if you're gonna be a leader, you'd better know the answer when asked, what do we do? In the military, what we do is very simple. Every one of us swears an oath to the Constitution of the United States to support and defend that. Uh, and there's 72 words in an officer's, officer's oath. We know that cold and we know what's important. We swear to God that we will defend our nation. Uh, and everyone knows that part and process, whether it's a foreign or whether it's a domestic enemy. And certainly the organization regardless of the service, everyone knows exactly what is expected of them in peacetime or combat. In effect, your military, like many other organizations, exist to provide a service. Our service is freedom. Our service is your freedom. Uh, and certainly, we are very proud of that. And we are very proud of the veterans uh, who have served and those who will serve and those that are in harm's way tonight as we speak. Uh, and we'll remember them on Veterans Day on 11, 11, 11, 11. Now, a good leader must be an expert in the workplace. Absolute must. He or she who lacks sufficient expertise in the workplace will not survive, period. If you don't know your game, you can't play the game. Uh, and no amount of motivation, no amount of inspiration or dedication that can overcome that lack of skill. We've all known people that are great people and they're misaligned to a particular job. Maybe that's occurred to some of you. Uh, I have been misaligned in jobs before, jobs that paid well, 
uh, before joining the military. I slung bricks for a couple years between my sophomore and junior year here. I hated it. And the guy that I slung him for hated me too. Uh, and so he finally said, you know, North, you're a nice guy and you can, you're muscular, you can, you can move bricks and mortar, but you stink at helping me as my assistant. Go do something else. I went, good, I'm gone. So whether you lead from the front or you push from behind, don't be the person that says, what do we do? Pay attention in the orientation, figure it out, and you're well on your way to becoming a leader. We all know formal leaders, we know informal leaders. Whether you're a formal or informal leader, people will look for you for guidance. And if you're in a formal leadership position and you cannot answer the what do we do, you better find out quick uh, because you will be moving away from the ranks of leadership. Become, become, if you will, the expert, not an expert. If you don't know your job cold, then you need to work on it. Uh, and you need to continue to work on it. That's what continuing education in the workspace or here in the educational workspace is all about. Moore's Law applies in everything we do. Uh, I wouldn't want a doctor operating on me that hadn't gone back to a refresher class. Uh, and certainly the things that we do in the business world and the IT world, and frankly in every world, are changing so rapidly that if you don't adapt, you're a dinosaur and you'll be gone very quickly. And again, like my particular instance, either your boss will realize you don't have the know-how and they'll start looking for someone else or eventually you'll burn out and move on. Third, making yourself a part of that team. A part of the team, not indispensable. When each one of us and each one of you take a key position, you should be prepared the minute you accept the position to be prepared to leave. It's easy in the military, because particularly if you're in a command position, because you get the flag from your superior commander who has just gotten the flag from the person that you're replacing, and you know that your clock is ticking. Normally it's a two or three year command tour, for some, it's shorter. And so you should plan the first day you walk into any office prepared to pack everything up in your briefcase or rucksack and be prepared to move out, whether it's that afternoon, whether it's termination or moving into another job more rapidly than you thought, or whether it's at the end of a successful tour or a rotation. He or she who believes they are indispensable in life will fade away very quickly. You have to be part of a team. Standalones don't work in anybody's business. So execution. I'm not an English major, but for me, leadership is not a noun, it's a verb. Leadership requires action. Leadership in your actions in conjunction with both your style and your philosophy will determine your success. So I wanna leave you with a couple things to think about. Uh, in our military, uh, we execute when we bring in air power uh, or when we bring in power from naval guns, uh, we have what's called a nine line. And the nine line is a simple series of sentences and direction and guidance that's read from one person to another over the radio that describes the situation, the location, and the requirement. Basically, it can be I'm in trouble and I need a weapon here, or I need somebody to come in and pick up someone who's been wounded, or things of that nature. It gets everyone on the same page. It gets everyone focused on the immediacy and the requirement of something that could be life-threatening or something that needs to challenge uh, either an enemy or a focus area. The Leadership Nine Line has guided me through lots of situations throughout life, and so I'll leave you with these. There are nine points, uh, and in this, the first point's pretty simple. Pick your team. Some of you will go into HR, and you'll be responsible for giving recommendations to your CEOs. 
Some of you, as you grow, will become CEOs. Some of you, as entrepreneurs, will reach out and pick your own team very rapidly. Picking your team is important, and if you have the luxury to pick, you should take the time and pick wisely. Don't pick people that are just exactly like you. Uh, diversity in our business is very important. Most of us are very comfortable with the tribe that we live in and we grow up in, and we're very comfortable with the likes. My leadership recommendation is to go out and find people that are so different from you, who think so completely 180 out from the way you think that you should harness their expertise and, and their passion for what they think about. And then pick your team to make it work. And sometimes you have to reshuffle that deck very quickly. You should, if you're in the position, think about what you're going to direct. And in my case, or our case in the military and leadership positions, command. And we should give command guidance and intent and do it quickly and then move on. We will all have to plan, this is number three, all have to plan and prepare in today's time. You know, when I graduated in 1976, the only people who had computers were the national government and a couple, uh, a couple institutions. 1982 is when the Kremenkos, the Tandys, the PC Juniors came out and we were first in line to get them because we craved to get away from typewriters and, and carbon paper to do our reports here at East Carolina. So planning and preparing in today's time is important because the pace of life is much different than what it was when I was a student sitting in your chair. Today, you're linked, you're tweeting, stuff's on the Facebook page, you can, sometimes you're not even talking to your instructor because you're doing it virtually. Uh, and today's time happens like that. There's no way you can say the dog ate your, your paper in today's world. Uh, so planning and preparing in today's time in the business world where time is money and deals are cut in milliseconds is very important. Number four, coordinate and direct, but mostly direct because coordination can go forever, and the email trail of coordination can, can, can absolutely uh, overwhelm the IT folks. So direct, 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 and move on. Kind of tying into my work experience as a bricklayer, don't confuse enthusiasm with capability. We have a lot of enthusiastic people in the world, a lot of high-speed cheerleaders, a lot of wannabes, and a lot of people that are really good, and we like them a lot, but they don't have the capability to do what they need to do and what the job description requires from them. So don't confuse that enthusiasm with capability. And don't allow yourself as a leader to be overcome by your emotions or your feelings for someone and keep them on the payroll well belong where you should have cut them out from the herd and offered them a graceful solution to find something better that more fits their personality and capability. Which gets to the next point, which is make everybody that works for you, alongside of you, and more importantly, make yourself accountable. Pretty simple. If it's you, you've got to look at yourself in the mirror and make yourself accountable for what you've been tasked to do. For those who are on mom and dad's payroll, you know, C minus isn't hacking it. Uh, we had a freshman, uh, our youngest son, University of Illinois, graduated about a 4.6 with, with uh, you know, special classes out of high school, and uh, he, he turned in a marvelous 2.1 at the University of Illinois in his first year. We sat down and had a heart-to-heart -heart mom and dad discussion and said, you know, you're not holding yourself accountable for your capability. He turned the tide, he did very well, and he's very productive in society today. But he chose not to make himself accountable to meet his capabilities in his first year. Happens to most of us. You have to attack your results, folks. An attack can be in the business world, it can be in any world, but attacking means you're moving forward. And you cannot rest on your heels when you have a success 
that's time to lean forward in the straps and start moving to the next objective. Because I will guarantee you there's someone out there with an idea or a process or a capability or a marketing tool just as good or better than yours, and they are working in today's time. Now, the fact of life is people are going to die. That's why you should never be an indispensable person. You must set the condition so that if something happened to you at the end of the day or on vacation or uh, you pass away in the morning, that the person in your organization can go in, sit down in your workspace, and continue the mission. In the field, in the military, we call that Charlie Mike. You have to, in an organization, not be so tempered that you cannot let your organization move on if you're not there. If you feel like you're the indispensable cog in the wheel, then you're not playing organizational ball the right way. And then in business, you must be able to debrief. Just like in life, one of the hardest things that we do is give direct and honest feedback to our subordinates and receive it from our superiors. No one likes confrontation. How many times will you see uh, someone kicking at the floor and looking away when they're trying to tell you that you're not, quite frankly, hacking the program, but they don't want to tell you that, and they mealy mouth away saying, you know, oh, you're doing okay. Man, I keep doing it. You have got to debrief and give positive or give feedback, positive or negative, and it has to be formal. And then you've got to have an attitude to win. So in debriefing every, everything you do, it's got to be rapidly after the event, and then you've got to move on, and then you've got to continue for your organization to go forward. Let me talk about mentorship because, and I'll close with this, and then we'll answer some questions and, and go from there. Mentorship is very important. I got asked by a young ROTC cadet today, how do I find a mentor? Well, I'll guarantee you in your organization business, regardless of what you do, someone will find you. They will see something in you that they have seen in themselves earlier on, and they will want to take you because ultimately, each one in a leadership position is looking for their replacement. Each one that has been entrusted with an organization and is moving it forward wants to find that person who they know will take it to the next level. Uh, and so mentorship is very important. It's not brown nosing. It's not sucking up to someone. It's finding a professional development relationship where you can learn. And you should choose a mentor from or be looking for someone to help you because your mentor will choose you, not the other way around. Someone at each concurrent level all the way up to however long you want your vision to look. Whether it's an entry level person that's gonna help you navigate your way through the building because the building is so large that you must find a way to do that, all the way to, to a senior leader or a senior CEO in your particular area of expertise. And throughout the years, you will progress past where you're now at a, nevel, a new level and a new step uh, and you will find that that network of people who has a vested interest in you, just like you must have a vested interest in your peers and subordinates, will be very important to you. Uh, networking is important. Uh, it's formal and informal. Uh, you should use it judiciously, uh, and you should take advantage of the expertise because people are giving you what is their most precious resource, and that is their advice, and their time. Let me close with uh, three things for you. Colonel Dave Stevens, who was here in the audience, uh, the attorney for East Carolina University, had a huge career as an Air Force officer, leader, and aviator. And then certainly uh, 
I went to law school and a huge career uh, as an attorney. I didn't know Colonel Stevens, but I went to East Carolina University ROTC with his son, retired Colonel Dave Stevens, and I met his grandson, now Captain Tom Stevens. I met Colonel Stevens at, at Tom Stevens' uh, graduation from undergraduate pilot training uh, several years ago, and I've had the pleasure and the privilege to, to uh, navigate through and see both him uh, and his grandson a couple times since then. I spoke at a graduation, graduating young lieutenants who got pilot wings on their chest. Uh, and after that discussion, Colonel Stevens sent me a note, and he said, I'd like to share with you what I believe are very important colonels in life, not colonel with a seed colonel, but colonels like seed corn colonels. And he wrote me a note out of the blue a senior airman and a senior leader here in the university, seeing someone that he thought maybe he could provide a little guidance to, and I was a three-star at the time, and believe me, three and four stars need a lot of guidance. He said, uh, I wanna share this with you. Here's the purpose, of, the purpose of life and some things to think about, and I'd share this with each of you. The purpose of life in our business, the purpose of life in our lives, the true purpose of life is for each one of us to discover our gifts. Think about that. If you're gonna write anything down, and some of you probably have the iPhones that are recording all of this, if you're gonna write anything down, write these three things down and think about them. The purpose of life is to discover your gifts. The meaning of life is to give those gifts in abundance. The meaning of life is to give those gifts in abundance. And then the direction of life is to whom, where, and for what reason you will give those gifts. The gift we've been talking about today is the gift of leadership. So, you will discover your gifts of leadership as you continue to grow both here academically, both personally and professionally you will determine how you want to give those gifts. Don't be selfish, because if you've got a gift, whatever it is, you should give it, and you should give it in abundance. You cannot take it with you when you leave this earth. So give it, and I will guarantee you, much like the movie, paying forward really works. And then that direction is to whom, where, and for what reason you choose and it is your choice to give those gifts. Thank you very much for allowing me the opportunity to come and talk to you, the business school and, and the faculty that is here and others who have come. Uh, and we've got a couple minutes, I believe, about 10 uh, to answer any questions that you have. I'm told, and it worked when I was a student, that at the end of the hour, um, we always ask the engineers to come spray uh, for insects so that everybody would be forced to leave. So the hour is up at uh, 16.30 or 4.30, uh, and I'll come back to the back of the auditorium uh, for those who may want to have a discussion that's not, uh, they don't want to ask a question uh, in front of everyone. Again, it's been a real privilege and a pleasure to be here. Thanks very much, and good luck in your studies and in the world. Hello, how you doing, sir? Um, Lieutenant James Ray, I'm the commander of Bravo Troop 2nd 4th, just got from Afghanistan um, about four or five months ago. Um, started school here to get another degree. Um, as young officers and junior officers, um, as we move through the ranks, what would you say, um, it, or as leaders, what was the hardest part of developing your career or the hardest point of your career as you move through the ranks, sir? It's a great question, and, and thanks for your service. I spent the better part of three and a half years over in Iraq and Afghanistan, and, and uh, you know, our airmen, soldiers, sailor, Marines job on the ground is very, very tough, and I'm glad you're back getting more education. You're safe. Thanks. I think the hardest thing as you go through a career is, frankly, determining what makes you happy. How many of you have a mom or dad in a family 
who's trying to focus you into a career that you don't want anything to do with. I mean, we see it all the time in the movies and everything. You know, they're making me go be a lawyer or a doctor. They're making me go into the family business. Uh, Or you get into something and you go, oh, I hate this. But you plug on doing it. You put your head down in the trough and you go till the end of the trough. You look up and you go, where am I? Oh, I'm doing the same thing every day. I think the hardest thing that we've got to do is understand that, you know, we're all on a limited liability contract. And time goes fast. And while we're going to live a lot longer than perhaps our grandparents or our parents, you should take advantage of every minute of every day that you've got. Because ultimately at the end, much like in the movie Private Ryan, uh, you know, when the father says, uh, you know, uh, he turns to his wife and says, Tell me I've led a good life. Tell me I've been a good man. At the end of our days, you want to be able to look back and go, not only did I do what I wanted to do, but I was good at it. So if you find yourself at any time in life doing something that you don't want to do, or you're in a job that you're not excited about, change it. Because life's too short to trot on doing something that you're not happy with or you're not engaged with or you're not committed with. I think the most important word that you should have as a leader in any organization is passion. If you don't have passion for what you do, then you need to ask yourself why not. You know, whatever it is. If you're not committed to it to where when you go to bed at night, you go, boy, that was really a good day. I can't wait for tomorrow. You have to have passion. Now, there are ebbs and flows in all of our lives. There's challenges. There's pain. There's exhaustion, quite frankly. And there's a lot of, am I doing a good job and is it the right thing? You know, some of you believe you're going to go out and make millions of dollars. Good on you if that's what you want to do. It's not all about life. You know, go back to the three things I asked you to write down. Think about what the meaning of life is for you and whether or not you want to stay in one position. I've been in this job or in my career for 35 years. I do it till they send me horizontal to Arlington because I'm proud of the people I work with. It's a privilege to serve, and I have a passion for the people. I have a little brother who changes jobs. Little brother, he's 56. Um, He changes jobs every three months and has throughout his life. He's happy doing that, but he hasn't found that one job that he's got a passion for. So every now and again, You know, look yourself in the mirror and go, how am I doing? Is this the right thing? And really, it's how you are doing, not how people think you are doing. Find passion in something and then go for it because that's the most important thing in life. Believing in what you do and going for it and leaving something there for everybody else. Great question. That was good, that took, uh, we got three and a half minutes left, that's one question. I know how this works. When I went through one of my advanced degrees, we're in a room and, and it was not by purpose, but we called it the purple bedroom. And uh, I always giggled when they said, the students in the back of the room in the purple bedroom, we're gonna make you ask questions. So uh, one more question, then we'll let you get on your way. When did you understand that leadership by example um, was so important rather than leadership by telling everybody what to do? I think it was when I was playing wiffle ball as a seven year old. And it was a bad example because I watched a guy on my team who back then, we can't do it now because it's not politically correct, but he was the nerd of the class. 
Um, he was the most uncoordinated individual. Uh, he'd get up and swing and miss and swing and miss and swing and miss and go away crying. His father was a type A, you know, driven, my son's got to be good. And I'd watch him go up with his son, and uh, back then you could yell at your kids and you could hit them and all of that type of stuff. And, and he would. And the son would go back in the dugout and cry. And then I watched sitting there, and we're all going, man, I'm glad that's not my dad. And we would all go over and kind of go, hey, that's okay, that's okay, you'll be all right. I watched a mother from the other team come over into the dugout and take him behind the dugout and show him how to swing the bat. That was leadership by example. I've never forgotten it. Uh, and so that kind of gets back to the, the unknown in our business. You know, you will find leaders who are leaders of character which is a tenant for our United States Air Force Academy to teach leaders of character. Uh, and so you will find leaders of character. They may be CEOs. They may be a truck driver. They may be the lady in your church who stays behind and cleans up after everybody else leaves. Uh, it could be a senior professor. It could be a freshman student you will find leaders of character who will show you the way to lead by example in every walk of life. Pay attention, folks, because that education doesn't cost anything. That education is life. With that said, we have 20 seconds to 30 minutes after the hour. Thank you for attending, and good luck in your studies.